So, um, so let me go over um, the device that we're working on. We call it the deeply depleted channel or the DDC transistor. And what we've essentially done is we've we've taken this we've taken a standard bulk planar transistor. And you know, our thinking here is, you know, why change it if you don't have to? If you can get FinFET-like advantages from a bulk planar device, it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper. You can lower the voltage. It's, you can control the variation a lot better. It's going to be a better device. So what we do is we do channel engineering. So we take out the dose from the channel. You can see that in region number one over there. And then what we do is we put in two very discrete planes of charge. Um, the, 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 layer num the layer number two is what we call our VT setting layer. And again, like as I said, you need multiple VTs in order to be a good low power SOC technology. And by changing the dose in those layers, you know, if you think about it, dose, you know, dose is 3D. Okay, so it's like I'm sitting at a, I've got a table with a tablecloth on. If I pull up the middle of the tablecloth, I don't just have, you know, tablecloth go up in, you know, this direction. It comes up on the whole table. So I don't need the halo dose between the source and the drain. I can put the dose underneath and it still applies the potential above it, right? So that's how I'm able to change the potential in the channel. And then the third layer over there is our screening region. And what this does, it actually, it terminates the depletion depth. But because it's so hard dose, it actually keeps the depletion depth constant across the channel. So if I'm keeping the depletion depth constant across the channel, it means my VT is going to be constant, which means that I'm going to have much less VT vari variation. So basically, the, the ability to, you know, we looked at the problem, we looked at the problem, we said, okay, we need it to be depleted. So we need a way to terminate the depletion, but we also need a way to change the VTs. And this is the structure we basically came up with. Now, another advantage to having uh, region number three, because we've got this reservoir of dose, is our body coefficient is very strong. Okay, now if you go back 10 years, body coefficient was actually quite actively used in designs. You can use it to, you know, either speed up a device or you can use it to save on leakage. However, it kind of went out of fashion, and it went out of fashion because if you look at um, body coefficients for CMOS technology, as they scaled, they went away because as your short channel effects increase, you don't have any. Uh, body control anymore. As it turns out, you can imagine from the FinFed architecture, there is no body control because you can't really get that potential. You know, you've got this little opening at the bottom, you can't get the potential into the fin. So this is the structure we're basically working on. And the whole idea behind, behind this is, you know, the, the last line on the slide, which is, you know, similar benefits to FinFed, but in, you know, good old fashioned bulk plane of CMOS. So here's some silicon results, which we have. And what I have over here is I have, uh, this is from a from an SRAM, and what happens is because remember I said to you because you're depleted, you get a performance boost, right? Um, so what happens is we're able to run our transistors at 0.9 volts instead of 1.2. This is 65 nanometer technology. Um, we're able to run it at 0.9 instead of 1.2 and have the same performance. So we get a 50 percent, you know, it's CV squared F. So we get a 50 percent power savings from our technology. And the other thing you can see here, what I'm plotting is this is a scatter plot of the different VTs within the SRAM cells. And you can see how much tighter our distribution is. And that's kind of summarized um, over here where we plot the um, SRAM mismatch. And you can see that we're about 40% better on PMOS and about 60% better on NMOS. And that's a huge amount. I mean, usually if you go into, um, if you go to a foundry, they'll tell you, God, if you can just lower our Sigma VT by 15%, we could hit our SRAM targets. That's a big problem that they're having now. They can't hit the, the SRAM targets. So 40 and 60% is a very, very sizable number. Um, I'm not going to go, go, go over this. That's not too interesting. But this is actually very interesting. So what I have pl plotted over here, the solid lines in both plots is calculation. And I wish I could tell, t tell you this was done on a supercomputer, but it was actually done on my six-year-old PC using Excel. And the shaded lines over here is actual data. So what this was is, if you take a million transistors, okay, I know what the leakage is, right? So my leakage is exponentially dependent on VT, right? It's, it's dependent on my swing and my VT. It's a standard equation. And I know that my distribution is most probably going to be a normal distribution, a Bell, Gaussian, whatever you want to call it. And um, what happened is if you do the calculation, so I've got two different curves here. I've got the red and the green. So the green is a Savolta transistor, which, which has 30 millivolts of VT variation. 
Um, the red is a standard halo based one which has 60 millivolts. So that's at 50% savings I was basically showing you. And what you can see is when we actually got the, da the data back, it lasts pretty much where the calculation was, which is good. But what I have on the right hand side here is I've taken these distributions and I've actually computed the leakage distribution. So what the leakage distribution is, my leakage is exponentially dependent on VTE and subthreshold swing, right? Uh, slope. So what happens is, even though my distributions are symmetric around the center VT, I've got an exponential curve here of leakage which does that. So what happens is, when I plot the leakage distribution, you can see that it's the red curve, which is the one with the, you know, the wider VT variation, it's shifted. And it shifts towards the lower VT. So what this is telling you is that if you've got a million transistors, it's the leaky transistors in the tail of the distribution which are actually going to cause most of your leakage. So w this happens all the time. You'll see, you'll see a company go, okay, we've got a chip, it's got a billion transistors on, and the leakage is, you know, whatever, pick a number, one nanoamp per micron, and I know the width of my transistors, so this part sh leakage should be two watts. And then they go run the thing and they put on a tester and it comes back at five watts or something like that. The reason is, this is the reason. And it's because it's these transistors over here in the tail that will screw you on the leakage. Now the other thing is, these transistors over here are slow. Now when, you design, when you're designing a, a, a CPU, like Intel, they do binning, right? So this transistor over here is your $2,000 Pentium Pro kick-ass, whatever it's called. And this one over here is the 50 buck part, okay? It's the same design, it's the same piece of silicon, it's just where it goes in the distribution. But if you're in the ASIC market, which is a huge market, right? There is no binning. There's either passes or it doesn't pass, okay? So what happens is, in the ASIC market, your leakage is set by this part of the tail and your performance criteria are set by this part of the tail. So basically only everything in between passes. So the more, the wider this, dis this distribution, actually I've got a slide on this. This is the type of stuff I want you guys to, I'm, I'm going to skip and come back. This is the type of stuff I want, I want you guys to basically understand. If I'm a process, and again, remember this, yield equals profit, yield equals money, okay? It's not a science experiment, it's a business. So what happens is if I'm in that distribution, only the stuff in the middle I can sell. The stuff over here runs too hot and the stuff over here runs too slow. So by tightening up that distribution I can sell more parts. Furthermore if I use a body bias on the parts that are too slow I can forward bias it and then make them yieldable and just fuse it out its sort. And the same thing for the reverse body bias. So the thing is variation and variability is not just Something that's, oh, it's a, it's a pain, we'll, we'll work around it. It has real financial effects at the end of the day, and it has to be controlled. Not only does it affect your leakage, but it does affect your yield. And it's becoming more and more hard, it's becoming more and more difficult to achieve high yields um, at the advanced nodes. Okay, so this is basically uh, coming back to, I'm not sure if you guys have ever seen these, these are called butterfly curves, this is how they characterize um, SRAMs. Uh, the basic takeaway here is in order to detect the state, you have to have an eye in the butterfly curve. So you can see for the control, 65 nanometer technology, and these are all measurements, it's not simulation, you can see that the eye basically breaks down between, eh, call it 0.7-ish, okay? And our eye is still pretty much visible at about 0.4, at about 0.3 it's gone, but about 0.4 it's there. So why is this important? Well, when you look at design, designers, they design in about 20% margin, they'll design in 20% margin for their V-min. So that means that if they want to run a chip at one volt, their V-min has to be 0.8. And if their V-min is 0.9, well guess what, they're going to turn that voltage up to 1.1, okay? So this is very important in order to scale the voltage of a device and um, to lower power. Okay, so the other thing is, and this is, again, what you guys should basically think about when you're doing your projects is, how do I get tricky? How do I take a technology and basically go, I'm going to use this in a different way than people have actually thought? And this is what this graph is. So what we basically did is we took um, one of our transistors and um, we characterized the thing and then we did some spice sim simulations. And actually, I believe we do have... The 
data which corroborates this now. And basically what you can do if you have a technology that has a low variation is it gives you the ability to change the voltage. Now, I'm not saying you can go from 1 volt to 0.5 volts or 0.6 volts and have the same performance, but not everything needs to have the performance of an Intel CPU. Okay, there's a lot of parts out there, especially in the mobile world, where I'd rather have the thing, as I said to you, be 20% slower, but work for three days. And if you're able to control the variation, that's exactly what you're able to do. On the other side, if you have a good body bias, you can go into what's called tur you can go into turbo modes. Because turbo modes, if you're changing the, um, the inversion capacitance or the depletion zone with a back bias, you're not really, there's no integrity issues with the gate oxide, right? So what happens is, using these two things, I could basically lower, uh, I could go, I'm going to reduce my VDD to 0.6. I'm going to save, I'm going to be, be running at 1 6 of the power and my performance is going to be about 50% less. Okay, you might go, that's not for me, but there's a lot of parts over there where that's a good trade-off and you can't do that with all technologies because you have to have very good um, VT variation. And then the other one where you need a very good back bias is, tur is basically tur is, is, a, is a turbo mode. So what you can do over here is you can basically get a, whenever you want to define this 10, 20% improvement in performance, you do take a leakage hit, of course, but that's for, for instance, if you're, you know, you've got a cell phone and 99% of the time it's sitting in your pocket doing nothing, but the 1% of the time you take it out and you want to play Angry Birds, that's turbo mode. Because if it's always on turbo mode, by the time you take it out your pocket, there's going to be no battery left. Okay. So um, our technology, we think it provides FinFET-like uh, enhancements. Um, we think the drive current capacitance and the short channel effect are good. Um, very good var variability. We think it's a very good device for SOC. We're not looking at the, you know, the, the CPU market. I think the FinFET and Intel, they've got that covered. Um, and then we think as far as the, um, the, the foundry and the, fab, and the fab light market, we think it's a lot better there because we haven't really changed the fundamental uh, design of the transistor, which means that all the IP line, you know, all the IP and the libraries that are out there can be reused. And you must remember that, right? You guys going into the world where you're gonna be process and device engineers. There's someone on the other side who's basically designing with your part and they're spending just as much money and time as you are. So I think that's gonna be a change um, that's basically going to happen in the market is I think you're going to see a lot more interaction between technology people and design people because I think the days of just having that um, having that interaction be through a spice model or a process you know or, or basically a dev kit I think that's going to break down you're going to have more interaction between the two so the question is are FinFET's going to take over the world quite simply not anytime soon. Okay, I think you guys would be surprised if you pull a, you know, you're going to just search on the web for iPhone breakdown or whatever. There's all these guys that post the breakdowns of all, all the different parts. You'll be surprised. You probably, you know, you can take the latest piece of technology you bought. I guarantee you that more than half the parts in there are built on older, on older nodes. More than half. Actually, Guaranteed more than, more than half. Some of the most important chips in your cell phone are built at 130 and 180. Okay, so if you've got an iPhone, there's a company called Dialog, right? And what Dialog does is they make what's called uh, PMIX. It's Power Management Integrated Circuit. So the PMIX, what you know, you've got a 3.2 volt battery, right? But your CPU works at one volt. Your screen works at five volts. Um, you want the thing to power down, but still check your email every so often. That's what the P that's what the PMIX does. It's one of the most it's one of the most expensive chips behind the, behind the CPU. It's like three or four bucks, which you go, well, three or four bucks, it's nothing. It's, if you have a look at all the chips in there, the chips that are 20 cents. So three or four bucks is a lot of money. And uh, those chips are built on 130 and 180. Okay. And uh, they're not, okay, they're also not built completely on CMOS. They're built on uh, BCD processors. But that's not going away any time, 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 time soon. Same thing with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Think about Bluetooth, right? At one stage when Bluetooth first came out, it was 10 bucks for a Bluetooth chip. Bluetooth is free now. 
You ask me how much Bluetooth costs, it's free. It's just expected that you get a car, you're going to have Bluetooth. You get a PC, it's going to have Bluetooth. You got a phone, it's going to have Bluetooth. It's incorporated, it's built on an SOC, and nobody cares anymore, right? So if it's working at 65 and you've got something with all your, your radios at 65, it's going to stay there. There's no impetus to basically move ahead. So basically in the next four or five, five years, um, I think this is from Gartner Research up in Portland. I think they're correct. I think what you're going to see at the advanced nodes are going to be the high-speed GPUs, uh, the high-speed CPUs, and all th and 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 the very advanced APUs like the Snapdragons and the you know Nvidia Tegra. But for most of everything else, it's going to it's not going to rush there. It really isn't going to rush there. So the phone you buy in five years' time, it's still going to have 130 and 180 nanometer technology in it. Basically, it's never underestimate the staying power of existing technology, and and r r really what that comes down down to is this slide here, which is you know is the industry doomed? I've kind of sat here and told you, oh, there's no more scaling, tox is done, nulls is done, and the truth of the matter is, it's not going to stop. Okay, there's a lot of challenges lying ahead. There's more challenges lying ahead today for the industry than there were 10 years ago, and if you have a look at the semiconductor industry market now, so I'm including. Everything that goes onto silicon here, right? DRAM, SRAM, Logic, uh, LED lights, whatever the case may be, it's a $300 billion market and it's growing. Okay, even though PC sales have slumped a little, there's other, the analog market's exploding right now, right? Because we're, we're craving interaction with the digital world, right? And when you, when you interact with the digital world, it's always through analog. So the market's going to grow. But more, if you look at the total ecosystem around semiconductors, there might be 300 billion. And I don't know this number. I just pulled this number out of thin air. But um, 300 billion is the correct number, by the way. But the other number is I wouldn't be surprised if the ecosystem around semiconductors is well above a trillion dollars. OK, software, um, mobile phones, you know, Sprint, all, all these companies. They all, you know, these companies, you know, you wouldn't have Android if you didn't have you know, little handsets, okay? Uh, you know, you wouldn't have um, cell companies rolling out LTE and, and, you know, if you didn't have the ability to have a phone which could handle three megabits per second or six megabits per second. You know, it wasn't too far long ago that you know, I remember my dad brought home a 28K modem, you know, and I had the 14K and I was like, Dude, this is outstanding. You know, and the truth of the matter, as technology goes up, our demand for it goes up. So it's not going to go away. The question is, what's it going to be? I don't know what's going to be in 10 years, but there's tons of challenges out there. And um, one thing I, will, I do believe, and I do believe we're actually already seeing it now, is you know, the so-called two-year cycle. Every two years, there's a new technology node. I think that's going to slow down. Um, I think you've already seen that slowdown. Intel was about six to nine to nine months late with their FinFET. It's not a knock on them. I mean, I know, you know, I, I left Intel in the mid, you know, midway through the FinFET development. And um, it, 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 they did extreme, extremely well. But even though they did that and they increased their CapEx and they put more engineers on it, it's becoming much, much harder to basically do these technologies. So I think you might see changes in that. You know, the two-year cycle is definitely, I think, going to become a three, four, five, five-year cycle. And then my personal thought on this, I haven't heard anyone say this, but I think you're going to move to an incremental type market. Where instead of going, you know, I'm going to use you know, 28 nanometer, and two years from now it's going to be 20 nanometer. I think you're going to start seeing guys do incremental changes, you know, where it's going to be, you know what, we're going to stay on 28 nanometers and we're going to re-release it with a new design kit where there's 10% performance increase, you know, and something like that. So I think you're going to start seeing things like that. But basically, there's, you know, what the market needs now is basically more smart engineers like you guys. And, um, you know, the, 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 it, it's actually a good time. Uh, to be in the semiconductor industry because, as I said, there's so many challenges ahead that uh, you know it, it's very tough to get a lot of high high quality uh, um, new engineers who are interested in this stuff. So I think you guys have got a bright future ahead of you, and it, it's going to be different from what you've read about in the last 20 years, but um, it's going to be a good one. And that's it. Any questions? I oh, think.